In room 14, it says, I'm really sorry to the troops, I must do better. In the end, they gave up. Now, I am joined for Talking Pints, because I think we need it this, after this very long day, mm. by Professor Matthew Goodwin, academic, Cheers. political professor, commentator, Cheers, TV star, <laughs> and student, very much yourself, mm. of centre-right politics yep. in the United Kingdom. Yep. You're the second person this week I've had in his written books about. We had Michael Crick in the other right. evening. Yep. Um, and you wrote, you wrote Revolt on the Right about yep. UKIP and the rise of UKIP. Yep. I, I just... It's so interesting, talking to Alex Crowley yep. there a few minutes ago, you know, with Boris from 2007, all through two terms as mayor, you know, he goes through, becomes foreign secretary, prime minister. Yep. And Crowley says, you know, I mean, really what Alex was saying is that Boris never really believed in anything. I think that certainly came through in his premiership. You know, I remember we first started talking about British politics 10 years ago, uh, 2012. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at that point, we were starting to notice in British politics the emergence of a large number of voters that felt very unhappy with the liberal consensus in Westminster, mm. you know, that was basically pro-EU, pro-immigration, um, pro the political um, establishment in, in uh, Westminster and London. And what happened over the last decade is that that group really grew and they voted for UKIP, they voted yeah. for Brexit and then they voted for Johnson. I think ultimately, though, Johnson really never connected with the people that put him into power. And I think in that respect, you know, Johnson is the beginning of a bigger problem for the Conservative Party because whoever succeeds Johnson now, I think, has this really difficult balancing act. They've got to somehow hold those voters in the north, in the Red Wall, in Yorkshire, the Midlands, coast, coastal towns, small towns, and hold the southern shires, middle class, graduate, prosperous. And those two groups of voters are very different, as you will know from your campaigning days. Yeah. And I just don't see anybody at the moment who I think can pull that off. Did Johnson take the party down the path of being a social democrat party more than a conservative party? Well, somebody uh, wrote this week that one of the ironies of Brexit is that it actually ended up giving us a European model of the economy. It gave us a big state, higher taxes, etc. And I see some truth to that. I think the problem with Johnson, as your previous guest alluded to, you know, Johnson, I don't think, really knows who he is ideologically. I think he's all over the shop. He's, you know, here one minute, he's there another. And I don't think that, you know, Johnsonism didn't really exist. It was the man with a few three-word slogans and, and that was it. Um, Whoever follows him now has to come in with a serious blueprint for, you know, how they're going to fix Britain. And I can't think of anybody, maybe Margaret Thatcher is the exception, who's coming into power with an in-tray that is this daunting. You know, inflation, productivity crisis, low growth, uh, Ukraine, you know, list goes on and on and on. And they're going to have to have an ideological blueprint for that. They're going to have to have a coherent, intellectually sound vision. Thatcher surrounded herself with very clever people. Even Blair got a lot, lot of things wrong, some things right, but surrounded himself with some pretty clever people. Johnson, there was nobody really there. There was nobody in Team Johnson that was sort of, that got it, that had a, a bigger vision for the country. So whoever follows him. Did Cummings have a little bit of that in terms of wanting to reform the civil service, etc.? I, I think Cummings had a few ideas around, you know, trying to sort of build a technocracy, trying to sort of reform the civil service, but it wasn't very profound. It isn't very profound. I don't think he's sort of in tune with the, the kind of the realignment that is going on in British politics at the moment. And in a way, I don't think this saga has ended. I think this is just at the end of a chapter. And I think what, what is coming in British politics even now, I still think neither left nor right are fully in tune with a large chunk of the country. And if you look at the last 10 years, um, Nigel, all the evidence shows levels of volatility, the number of people who are switching their vote oh, from yeah. Labour to Conservative, yeah. Conservative Lib, De Lib Dem, Labour to Green, has never been higher. We've got about 60% of people in the last decade that changed their vote. So we're not going to go back into sort of nice, you know, two-party Labour Conservative politics. If anything, I think we're going to just continue to see this remarkable churn that we've seen over the last couple of days and the last decade. Yeah. Lots of turbulence, lots of turmoil. And I don't know for certain where it's going to end up, but I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up with new parties, um, new alignments, new geographies. That, that would happen if we got a change to electoral law. Mm. Because under the first-past-the-post system, it's very, very difficult for new entrants. Difficult to raise money 
because their donors finish up being given bills for inheritance tax. It seems almost incredible, mm. but it's exactly what happened to many people who gave me money. Um, difficult to overcome the postal vote, mm. where you know the Labour Party and Tory Party have already huge numbers signed up. They can turn those votes out. It's not easy. But what I detect is something quite interesting. See, I think Brexit was about a lot more than just leaving the European Union. Absolutely. It was about, we don't want London controlling everything in our lives, that narrow clique, and we've touched on that mm. earlier on. But actually, Brexit, and it was really interesting, when we formed the Brexit party, and in six weeks won those elections in dramatic mm. style, our slogan was change politics for good. Yeah. A feeling that Brexit could be a fresh opportunity, mm. a brand new start. I don't think the Tory party ever understood that. And yet I detect, and you may think I'm wrong, I detect a growing appetite for proportional representation in some form, an appetite for electoral reform. I'm beginning to see it, and interesting, isn't it? You know, even people like Lord Mandelson saying mm. we've got to start mm. talking about this. Mm. Andy Burnham pretty much now advocating for it. The Lib Dems have always believed in it, and yet when Clegg had the opportunity, he went for a system that wasn't proportional, was, mm. pre well, was preferential, it couldn't be explained in a yeah. sentence, uh, which is why Facebook shares are doing so badly now he's there. Um, but do you think that big change is coming, or will it be resisted to the hilt? I, I agree with you. That's why I, I mentioned the prospect of new parties, because I think but on both the, the left and the right, I think there is a growing consensus that first past the post is, is not going to be sustainable over the longer term. I think if you talk to Lib Dems, if you talk to Labour activists, you talk to Greens, you talk to disillusioned progressives, you know, all of whom are sort of saying, actually, this system is yeah. not really working out. If we, if we do go to some form of proportional representation, obviously that is a complete game changer. I think also generationally, actually, there's a really important point. I think if I talk to my students about electoral reform, you know, they're Generation Z, they're born after yep. 1996. Yep. They look at first past the post as a sort of old fashioned system that isn't in touch with their values. And I think as, you know, Gen Z and the millennials continue to go through the system and a lot of decisions have gone against the, those, those generations, you know, they weren't happy with Brexit, they weren't happy with Boris Johnson. I wonder actually if this question of political reform is going to become much more I prominent going I forward. I sense it is. I sense it is. Interestingly, the Burnhams of this world think if you have PR, there'll be a permanent anti-Tory, anti-conservative hmm. coalition. Hmm. What, of course, they're not factoring is there would be a new UKIP-style party on the centre-right of British politics that would get millions of votes. That's my view. Well, I think also the Labour Party would essentially break into two different yes. parties. You'd have a radical left Corbyn-type party. You'd have a sort of, you know, third-way-type party. The Conservatives would almost certainly break into two. You'd have your sort of one-nation liberal Conservatives, and then you'd have your sort of UKIP Brexit party-type Conservatives. Yeah. And I think, you know, maybe that would be a healthier place for the country. You know, clearly, you know, we're now coming up six years after Brexit. We are still divided. We're still arguing. We still haven't managed to get into a place where, you know, we all feel sort of good about the country. We're ready to kind of embrace this new future. And whoever replaces Johnson, you know, this again, I think is key. They're going to have to come into office with a serious plan here for bringing the country together and actually making the most out of the 2020s and the 2030s. They're going to have to think about what's the long term economic it's a big strategy. ask, isn't it? It's a big it, ask. It, it's, can you think of another point in British history where somebody has had a bigger in-tray than Boris Johnson's successor. I think successor. the in-tray in 1979 was pretty yeah. big. I, I think it was. I think the, you know, the catastrophes of the 1970s, the yeah. economic, uh, particularly economic catastrophes, the downgrading of the status of the UK mm. uh, to almost nothing, a sort of, you know, sick man of Europe, as it was called. So I think the in-tray was pretty big in those days. I think the difference is, and OK, we did have the Falklands War, but the difference is uh, we have China, uh, and goodness knows what kind of threat that may pose to us, ongoing war in Ukraine. I think, I think in foreign policy terms, uh, this is quite a tough place to be. I think domestically, tax-wise, no, I think we have been here before, but I think to turn it around is going to be very, very difficult. Well, I've got you here, Matthew. America, thoughts on America. I mean, Biden won that election by narrow, by very, very narrow uh, minority, minority uh, majority. We've got the midterms coming up. Yep. Are we going to see the Republicans racing back? 
Biden's approval rating just slumped to 36 percent, the lowest on record. About 88 percent of Americans are saying the country's heading in the wrong direction. Those are two pretty good indicators for midterm performance. I think the midterms are going to be very, very damaging for the Democrats. I think the Republicans are going to have a very good set of yeah. elections. And I think already you can see the key players positioning. My recommendation keep all eyes on Ron DeSantis in Florida. I think Ron DeSantis is a very interesting politician, uh, somebody who in somebody who I think in policy terms is much more interesting than Donald Trump. Uh, he's, you know, is he going to go for it or is he going to be satisfied with becoming Trump's running mate? Who knows? Also, watch some of the remarkable shifts in American politics. Hispanic Latino voters abandoning the Democrats yep. for the Republicans. Yep. That is something we haven't seen before. Keep your eyes on that as well. Um, and, you know, we've got inflation, economic crisis. That is never good for the... And Trump is still Trump. Trump is Trump. He's also still very unpopular in the wider country. About 60% of people say they don't want Trump to run again. About 60% say they don't want Biden to run again. Yeah, if anything, yeah. actually, American politics to me... Is it a worse state than ours? It looks, it looks ripe yeah. for an alternative. Yeah, it it looks really ripe for an alternative. Matthew, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Talking Pints on this really... Once again, historic day. Hard